So welcome everybody um, and to a very special talk we've got for you today um, from Do Dr. Tara Rutley. Now, um, you might not know, it's National STEM Clubs Week this week, and the theme this year for National STEM Clubs Week is space. So we're really lucky to have Tara with us to talk about jobs and careers in the space sector and the sort of things that she does. Tara works for an organisation called Blue Origin, and um, she has also worked for NASA. But there are lots of, um, we have a European space agency, um, uh, this side of the Atlantic as well. So um, much of what Tara's talking about is actually, you know, could be open to you as young people go into the space sector in the future. It's all to play for. So welcome, Tara, and I'll let you um, take over from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody uh, from across the world. I'm, I'm right now currently in Houston, Texas right outside the Johnson Space Center where I'm visiting for the week. Normally I live in Arlington, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, DC. Uh, this week I'm here visiting my space friends at the Johnson Space Center talking about a whole lot of work that needs to happen for the future of space. And it's a whole lot of hard work. I was having this conversation before you guys got on, on the line and I'll tell you why it's a lot of hard work as I, as I move through my discussion. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen because I've got some pretty cool charts and videos and things to share with you uh, just to kind of get you centered on what I'm going to talk about and get you a little bit inspired here. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see that? Okay. Great. Okay. So um, I am Tara Rutley. I am a space scientist. Um, I worked for NASA for 21 years, which was my dream job. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit here shortly. I left that dream job just about three months ago to work for Blue Origin, which is a private space company that really is important in doing some of the next generation and the future of space flight activities. And, and I will talk to you a little bit about why I did that and why I firmly believe that um, space science is important. And, um, and I'll talk to you about how I got to my career at NASA, um, how I got to Blue Origin, and then some of the other career opportunities in general. For those of you who are thinking about coming and joining the world community in going to space, because you know, like you heard, it's of course not just NASA. I work with my ESA colleagues, colleagues from Japan, colleagues from Canada, around the world. And, and now it's not even, the future isn't even just government space agencies. There are lots of smaller private space companies popping up and everybody wants to go to what we call the Earth orbit, which is circling the world, uh, like in a space station, or they want to go back to the moon. So I'm gonna talk about all those possibilities for you. And I want you to think about if you're a student, where you might fit in into this, because I think the future is bigger and greater now uh, now and in the future for you to join the space community, we're a big world community, than it ever has been in my entire career. When I grew up, I grew up a kid of the 80s, and this was the vehicle that I loved. This was the, the United States Space Shuttle. And these are what I watched. I watched these launches, I watched the landings, and I was a shuttle hugger. This is what got my attention. And this is when I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. But mostly about being an astronaut, what I wanted wasn't to build the vehicle it wasn't to build hardware. It wasn't to do space engineering or, or operations. It really was about what's going on in this picture here. And this is a group of astronauts inside of the space shuttle payload bay. They're doing experiments. If you look closely, they have equipment all over their head, their leg, they're taking notes. They're doing really neat experiments. And they would do things like, like test how water behaves, test how animals react, uh, test how the space environment changes their body. They were kind of some of the first you know, there were some programs before this, but these guys are who got my attention when I was your age. And that's when I knew I really wanted to be an astronaut, but not just, I didn't want to be an engineer. I wanted to be a scientist. Um, but people growing up told me if I wanted to be an astronaut, I had to be an engineer, but I knew I really wanted to be a scientist. So uh, we visited and um, I grew up in Louisiana. We took a field trip one day, about three hour drive over to Houston, Texas. And I got to meet an astronaut and asked him, what does it take to be an astronaut? That's really what I want to do. And he said, you know what? The future is, is uncertain with space flight right now. It's so challenging to get to be an astronaut. Thousands of people apply. 
Only very few make it. And even the best, just for whatever reason, don't make it. So we want you to do what you love. Do what you love. You'll get really good at it. You'll have a blast doing it. You never want to regret looking back on your life, doing something just because it looked good on your resume. So go do what you love. And that's exactly what I did. <coughs> and that love was science. <coughs> So I, I went and I got my undergraduate degree in biology and, and um, in college. While I was at it, though, I, had, I met some engineering students and we got to work on projects together that were really important. By the end of my time at uh, college, uh, they said, you know what, you should apply to get a mechanical engineering degree. I, I wasn't interested in engineering still. I wanted to go and be a neuroscientist um, and I wanted to do that for NASA. Uh, but they said, you know, just apply. You never know. Go ahead and apply to the mechanical engineering graduate program. I mean, you, you never know how it shakes out. You know the people, you know the things. So I applied and now I got in. So what do you do when you actually got, you get in? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a firm believer that you investigate all opportunities. You don't turn opportunities down. Uh, so I dug in and figured out where I might fit in into a mechanical engineering graduate degree. That's a two-year program for a master's degree in engineering, mechanical engineering. And I did that and I had a blast. Was it hard work? Yes, because I'm a biologist, but it was super great. I don't regret it. And at the end of that, NASA wanted to hire me. They wanted to hire me to join this vehicle program that you see on your screen right now. They wanted to hire me because I had both backgrounds in biology and engineering. And they had just created a new department called biomedical engineering. And they needed me to design and build medical hardware for the International Space Station and exercise hardware for the space station. They needed someone with that dual background. So my, my message to you students who are listening is if you have more than one interest, it's okay. It's a really good thing. Uh, space needs you to have more than one interest. The world in general needs you to have more than one interest in solving problems with, uh, within STEM and using your STEM skills and your STEM thinking for that. So I ended up joining the International Space, Program, Space Station Program in 2001, right after they sent their first crew members there. Now, Space Station's been up there for over 20 years, uh, and, there, and there's a constant rotation of crew. Um, so, I, so to sum that whole career thing up, I did exactly what I wanted. I studied what I wanted. Uh, I was prepared for the opportunity when NASA came with something that was a perfect fit for me that I couldn't even I couldn't even foresee. This was a career I didn't even know existed. And this is going to be your future. You, there will be careers that you don't know exist. They don't exist yet. And, and that's going to be part of the discussion we'll have here later today. So, so, so that you know what the space station is, I'm going to share with you a, a quick video because um, you know, we know it's up there. It's about 250 miles above our head. Uh, it's circling the earth once every 90 minutes. It's going 17,500 miles per hour. Um, it is a collaboration of international partnership like nothing ever before in the world of, of space industry. And that means a collaboration with our uh, ESA partners, our Canada partners, JAXA, uh, who was our Japanese partners, and our Russian uh, partners as well. Uh, and I will tell you that the point of the laboratory is to do science in space. It is a laboratory. Yeah, it's a really cool vehicle to do flips and spin around and you know have some fun. We do some spacewalks, important spacewalks, um, but it was only built really to do science experiments in space. We do them for basic discovery. Uh, how, do, how does fire behave in space and what can we learn about that on earth? How do plants behave? How can we design robotics? Uh, yes, we have flown fish uh, because you might be curious to know how fish behave if they're floating in water, how do they behave in space? We do experiments, everything ranging from life sciences to physical sciences to human health. Uh, he's exercising right there. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute as well. Um, you know, we with the work that we do on the human body is to make sure that the astronauts from all of the nations that go, stay safe the longer they stay in space because there are some changes to the human body in space. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So we do also send up a lot of student experiments. Uh, I'll share with you some videos of some really cool student experiments that we sent up that kind of shock 
uh, uh, even a, a traditional scientist and managers here uh, at the space station program. Space Station, as you know, also is, is a platform for observing the Earth. Our astronauts are up there. They're not robots, they're humans. They know exactly what's interesting to look at. They photograph the Earth, hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, and in the past, we have launched and landed to Space Station with our international partners at Russia. Now though, the United States has our own capability, our own launch vehicles. And so we have been launching um, ourselves uh, out of Florida on SpaceX rockets uh, designed by Elon Musk. Um, and, uh, and we have had some real great success for that. Um, you know, and the reason we have been launching with our Russian colleagues is because <clears throat> Space Shuttle, my favorite, retired back in 2011. So now we had a, a, a space station platform but but we didn't have the United States didn't have a way to get there anymore and our partners at ESA didn't have a way to get there so we've been working with the Russians for the past 20 years and it's been a very successful partnership despite some of the political the political turmoil you hear about um, we've had a great 20-year run with them and we are still collaborating by the way with our colleagues as best we can given the current political situation um <clears throat> We do the science on station and I kind of mentioned we do it for discovery, advancing textbook knowledge. And I'll share with you why in a minute. Um, we also do that to benefit those of us here on the ground. We learn new things we can in space, we can apply them to the work that, or, or what we need to maintain our health and our economy and our technology advancements here on earth. And then we also do it so that humans can go into space further and we wanna explore and we wanna stay longer. So this, the, the three types of science we do on station meet these benefits. But you're asking, probably thinking, why are we bothering even doing science in microgravity? Why are we doing science in space? I've not really used the word microgravity yet, but it really is about the microgravity. Why are we doing science in space? Well, <clears throat> think about your basic, you, you think about these words that I have on the screen, convection, buoyancy, sedimentation. These are things you guys are learning in your classes. And in the moment, they may not seem very exciting. Some of them are exciting to you, but maybe not. But these are really what we live in every day when we're thinking about designing experiments for the space station. The reason we use microgravity is because in every experiment as a scientist, you can control variables, every variables, light, temperature, heat, humidity, gas environment, right? You cannot change or get rid of the one gravity that's the, the one variable that's the strongest and that is gravity. That is the strongest variable we have. That's the strongest force we know. So in any experiment that you design, you can ask yourself, what would happen if I took gravity away? Uh, what kind of new discoveries would I see at the outcome? How will that change the next set of research that I do? How, will, how can I leverage those discoveries to benefit uh, what we need here on Earth or make something new for spaceflight or even just learn something new about basic fundamental science. Uh, you know, you, you, what you're looking at here is videos of actual spaceflight uh, phenomena. Uh, this is how we, we burn flames in space. That They don't burn like the, the typical convection flame that you see on the left on Earth because there is no gravity. So there is no relative density. So our flames behave differently. And what that tells us is we can study new levels and layers of the flames and, and layers of the products that come from flames that can help us burn cleaner energy on earth, that can help us put out fires in space uh, better in situations where we need to. Um, and, and even things like buoyancy, you're taught in your class that you know hot air rises and bubbles will rise because they're full of hot air. But you can see on earth, uh, in, that's, that's the left one earth, but on space in microgravity, there is again, no relative density. There, there is no buoyancy. There's no floating and there's no sinking. So what you get in space is one large heat bubble. One large bubble of heat and a bunch of little ones that get eaten up by the big one. There's a lot of bubbles to think about, but it's all about energy transfer and, and heat transfer. And it means a lot when you're designing something for space flight, like a, a space vehicle. Um, and then sedimentation, you know that when you take your cough medicine, for example, you have to shake that up really, really good so that the particles disperse and you get all the good stuff because on earth they'll sediment to the ground. Uh, what you're looking at the bottom is, an, is a, uh, a video from an experiment happening on the space station <clears throat> where the green is liquid and the black are green blobs of, of nanoparticles. 
And we're trying to have the particles float around in space without settling so that you can study how they actually interact with each other. It's a really hard thing to find out how these things interact with each other on Earth when they just keep wanting to settle to the ground. If we understand how they interact, we could probably build better materials, better fluids, um, and advanced technologies. So these are the reasons we want to go to the space station, send the best experiments to the space station, and use the leverage the microgravity environment for this. Uh, let's see. So here's a pretty fun video of of a GoPro camera inside of a blob of water. That's simply water. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it, most people wanna see what's inside the video of the camera. I am interested because look at how the water without the force of gravity, you know, can, uh, the uh, surface tension forces become dominant. You've probably heard surface tension. They are creeping and crawling. That water is creeping and crawling up the astronaut's hands. And when you talk to the astronauts, they, tell, they will tell me, you know, the one on the right told me that the, the water would just keep crawling. It started his fingertip, crawling up his fingers, up his hands, up to the elbow, and it would just keep crawling up to the shoulder if, it, if he didn't stop it. This water is not how we're used to be thinking about, right, on Earth. This is not how water behaves on Earth, but it's still obeying the fundamental laws of physics. Uh, and now that gravity's gone, surface tension takes over and, and becomes the dominant force. And if you're interested in designing for space, anything for space flight, these are the really unique challenges you have to face and you get to overcome uh, thinking about things that you don't think about on Earth. Uh, and then, you know, not only that, but the human body and every living system that we take to space flight is affected, that we take to space is affected by the microgravity environment. Everything from the tiniest little microbe to the cells, to the plants, to the the big system of our body. Our body and all living things on earth are designed for 9.81 meters per second squared. You look the way you do, you behave the way you do because of that really strong gravity vector. You have bones and muscles to hold you up and allow you to move against the gravity vector of earth. You don't need that if you didn't have gravity. Your heart pumps the blood around your body and it pumps the way it does to pump against gravity, moving it all around. It's a muscle. Uh, the fluid flows that way because of gravity. Uh, the way you process your meals are, are a lot about you know, gravity. The way that we form as, as development in development in utero as fetuses is really gravity driven. Plants have been on earth longer than humans. And uh, that picture in the middle is a dead pea plant. That's, a, that's one of the interesting experiments we had tried early on, uh, trying to grow crop foods that we can feed astronauts. We have a real challenge growing plants in space. We're getting better. We're not killing things anymore. <laughs> but um, remember I showed you that fluid behavior? Well, think about how you would water plants on Earth. The roots need not just water, but they also need oxygen. So uh, in space, the water, the way it creeps and, and attaches the way it does, it tends to choke the roots. It'll cover the roots and choke the roots if you don't water it correctly. Uh, it also, plants also like the light from the sun. How do you really replicate the light from the sun that makes the plants happy? And without convection, how do you get rid of the gases, the waste gases that plants give off and give the plants the good stuff, the carbon dioxide, the good gases that they need to survive? So gas exchange is important. And you know we have microbes that sometimes behave differently if we send up bacteria. Sometimes they'll they'll grow faster. Sometimes they won't do anything. Um, even our cells and our body uh, tend to signal to each other or change shape. Or cells and culture will change shape and talk to each other differently. And even sometimes, a lot of times, genes will be expressed differently and make the body do things or make the the tissues do things and and in certain ways that we would not have expected. So. So the world of microgravity is, is an area that, you know, is, is got so much more potential, even though we've been doing science for the last 20 years, every time we do a little bit of science, we learn something new and we want to keep going, not just for space exploration, but for our benefit on earth and for, for your knowledge as, as scientists and engineers. Um, like our, our astronauts also have this big challenge, like I mentioned, bone loss. I mentioned that the bones and muscles were designed specifically to keep you healthy on Earth. If you go to space, you don't need them. And that's exactly what happens if you're, all you're doing is floating around. The body's really good at getting rid of what it doesn't need. 
your bones will start to deteriorate and your muscles will start to deteriorate unless you do some exercise like you're saying in this video. In fact, the bones are so uh, prone to loss that it's accelerated. The bone loss is about one to 2% uh, per month in our astronauts, which is about, it, it exceeds that of a postmenopausal woman uh, who loses that at a, at a rate of one year. So the astronauts lose bones really quickly if we don't do resistive exercise and take the right amount of vitamin D and the right amount of calories. And these are all things that we learned on the International Space Station that'll keep our astronauts healthy when we wanna stay longer in space. Now we know what we need to do to keep our astronauts healthy with bones and muscles. And that's, yeah, they're gonna exercise a lot. But it's not just that. Um, we also send up experiments designed by students like this one. You're looking at an on-orbit uh, video of a spider at the top left of your column of your screen jumping at a fruit fly, its prey. This was designed by a group of students and the students just wanted to see if the spider would behave in space normally the way it did. And it took a minute, but it took a few days, but the spider eventually adapted to space flight and caught its prey. <clears throat> the most interesting thing to me is here, this video, where it's been returned to earth now. That spider tried to jump and catch its prey and turned upside down. It was so disoriented when it got back to earth, it had to, it, Fell, it fell, it kind of righted itself and eventually, and it kept going after its prey and it kept missing and missing and eventually it did get the prey and it lived in the Smithsonian uh, for a little while. Uh, it lived out its life there. But it's an, again, it's just a reminder that was a really neat experiment designed by students to show that even spiders who don't know they went to space <laughs> really are affected by that environment. So we love the student experiments. They come up with some really unique ideas that, that traditional scientists don't always think about. And for those of you who've grown crystals in school or at home, you know how the solution works. It's by adding one little part of a crystal to the next. And sometimes if you want a perfect crystal, convection gets in the way. The swirling around and the gravity, then the density gradients kind of can make your crystal not the best that, it want, that you want to be, you want it to be sometimes. And we have that challenge on earth. We want to grow proteins that are associated with disease. We want to grow the best crystals that we can so we can look at a structure of a protein, understand it and create a medicine or a treatment that'll tackle that, that particular protein and, and stop the disease. You can see on the left on earth, some of these crystals don't like to grow because that gravity environment just interferes. But in space, we oftentimes can grow really, really nice crystals. Again, because you don't have the convection, the buoyancy and the sedimentation of the particles you're trying to use to build a crystal. And we can create then better medicines and treatments for proteins against diseases that we, we'd rather treat here on Earth. So someone's got a hot mic. There we go. Okay, so I think that you guys probably know what this is a video of. Uh, when I started at NASA, these machines, which are rapid prototype machines, were so big, they took up half a room. Uh, and they were very, very difficult to manage. Now you can buy a, a 3D printer uh, just through, you know, online anywhere and, uh, and have one in your garage at a pretty reasonable cost or in your library or in your school. Um, this is an actual video of 3D printing happening on the International Space Station. A few years ago, we were really proud of this because as you know, if you've ever worked with these machines, depositing that material is very much gravity driven. You know, usually the pointer, the printer nozzle is going down and it's printing, you know, whatever your material is layer by layer. But we decided to try this on the space station because we know as we go and explore, we go to moon and we live on the moon longer and we go to the and we go to Mars and we live on Mars longer. We can't take everything we need with us. And so the engineers know that we've got to be creative and an advancement on on the tools and how we get our tools. And ideally, then. Now with, with 3D printing that we've been able to try out in space, we can take the types of materials that we like in big blocks and have our printer on orbit and ideally send up a command uh, to print out the tool that we need. Maybe we use that tool and then we recycle that material back later to print out something else that we need. So again, it's about creating, being, you know, for those of you who are interested in being engineers, it's about using your creativity to think about space flight in ways that make you think that of designs that are smaller, lightweight, uh, and most efficient 
not like you do on earth where you can just throw a tool in the toolbox. Um, and so we had good success here. And now we are also um, sending up, a, again, a recycler. So now we're gonna be able to recycle, we're testing out recycling materials, making something new. Um, I, I always like to ask what, I always like to ask the audience what they think the first, this is an example of a wrench, but the first item that was ever printed on this 3D printer in space, you can't really speak to me and I can't see the chat, but uh, I, will, I will tell you the very first item that was printed was not this wrench, it was actually a printer head replacement piece for the printer. It was a replacement part for the printer, right? You, you get, that makes sense. And so you guys are thinking, you know, what is my future here? And I'm listing right now for you jobs that exist today that you may have heard about that's in everyday language that did not exist 10 or 15 years ago. Driverless car engineer? What's a driverless car? That's the things that we would think would be only in movies. And we're seeing them come alive now. And we need people for that, right? User interface designer. Um, that's someone who designs equipment for, it, for people like me who are going to need to use my computer or gaming devices. You're going to design it and make it better for me. These are artificial intelligence specialists, sustainability consultant to help our environment. Drone operators, what was a drone 20 years ago? It wasn't something everybody had access to. It wasn't something that was used regularly. And I bring these up because um, that's happening. These are happening now in your lifetime. And in another 10 and 15 years, when you're entering the career world that you're about to enter, there will be jobs on earth that don't exist yet. And those are exciting. And we, we can't see them yet, but it will be the same for space flight. And I'll get to that in a minute. When I think about STEM, and when you think about STEM, you know, people might think about the qualities that you might have as a STEMist, a STEM student, problem solving, maybe your inquiry skills, maybe you're creative, maybe you are a critical thinker, or maybe you're like me, a collaborator. All of these things on the screen, I would have told you as your age, I wasn't any of these except for maybe a collaborator. Actually, I was, I was an introvert, so I wasn't any of these things on the screen. <laughs> I just knew that I wanted a career, I knew what I wanted. And that's not common, I wanted to be an astronaut. The word STEM did not exist when I was your age. So there was no real path. There was nobody recognizing, oh, she likes to solve problems. We suggest that she uses, you know, goes into the world of STEM. And so you may look at this right now and you don't see yourself anywhere in here. I guarantee you someone else sees one of these in you. And the point is, if you have an interest in anything that's adventure driven, problem solving driven, collaborative, um, you want to be creative. You may not see yourself as that, but I bet it's in you somewhere. And STEM is the world that you will join and you can belong to and work with the humanities group to solve the world's biggest problem. And it's not just space flight. It's, you know, the world's biggest problems these days, food, hunger, uh, climate, access to clean water, access to education, um, and, and those things. The, the STEM world needs you. So, you know, you fit in here. You may not see it, but someone else sees it in you. Um, I put this, I, I know this is kind of like a lot of words on a screen, but I went and cut this out of NASA's vision for who they like to hire. The kind of, so I, the previous screen were all kind of like technical skills, but there's the people skills part as well. And this to me is probably where I might've seen myself at your age, one of these. Um, team oriented, okay, maybe some of you don't like working in those group projects, right? But you will when you, when you get out of school and you like doing the, those kinds of things. A passion to explore, that was me. It was just a passion to explore. You got to be curious um, and, and resilience. Resilience is probably something a lot of you are learning right now. You just came through a few years of learning resilience with, with COVID. We all did. That was a really quick and hard lesson for you as a human and more will come. But these are the things that the European Space Agency, NASA, all of our partners across the global space industry, these are the human qualities that are needed to work with us globally in the space community in the future. These are not just space problems. These are not just space uh, traits. These are traits for anything you really are passionate about. Uh, no quit, do the best you can, don't lose the passion, be flexible because the world is changing, changing fast. These are your human skills. 
Now you've got, you're, you're right now in the position to develop your technical skills and think about where you fit into either space or, or, or how you can fit into the bigger world's problems that you need to help solve. Now, as far as the future of space flight uh, and, jo and jobs or careers that don't exist yet, I did my best to kind of think about where our global partnership is going in space and think about what kind of jobs that might be needed. And, and we do have these conversations uh, with our partners to think about you know, the future. Um, and so there are some jobs on here that don't, don't yet exist. Some of them do. Space medic exists, kind of. The uh, astronauts are trained to be medics, but that's not their career. So as our NASA and our colleagues at ESA and around the world go, our plans are first to go back to the moon and live longer. We're going back longer than we did for Apollo. We're gonna stay longer, which means all these things on the screen will eventually be needed. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it may be, and it may not be in the next five years, but it may be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. If you see yourself in here, um, welcome to the space world and you, you're welcome to join us, please join us. Uh, you look at that bottom, it's called, I, I put there just recently, space tourist manager, because um, uh, that's something that's happening a lot more lately. You, you hear about more and more average everyday people like you and I going to space. One student actually told me she was interested in being a moon Sherpa. I said, I said what, what's a moon Sherpa? She said, I know that lots of people are going to want to visit the moon. And when they do and they're touring the moon, I want to be the one that understands the geology how the moon was created, how it interacts with earth and our solar system. And I wanna be able to tour them around and show them the importance of, of this moon, of our moon. And I thought, I, fantastic. And, and you guys are our future. So if you see yourself in here, please, um, please join us. Um, the other thing I wanna say that I didn't include here is that um, we are also, now that I work for Blue Origin, uh, it's not just the moon that we're working hard on. It is, again, low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station that circles the Earth uh, about 250 miles above head. Uh, my job now, and the reason I left NASA, was to take my knowledge of space science and apply it to uh, a new space station that is being built called the Orbital Reef. Uh, we are one of a few space stations that are being built, not by ESA, not by NASA, not by a government agency, but privately. So then the purpose for that is not only to do science, but to also invite more of everyday people like you and I to join us, uh, to visit, to be able to actually have a chance to go to space, to these space stations. And it's a lot of hard work designing for you and me. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. And I think that you could also see yourself in low earth orbit. If you don't have an interest in going to the moon, you wanna stay a little closer to earth, then we need your help. Uh, and many of these things, um, there are all lots of opportunities for that in the next 10 years, probably shorter term even. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing now is uh, helping to design a science program for the space station orbital reef. Because right now, one thing I didn't mention to you is that the International Space Station is only designed to operate right now until the year 2030. And that includes your ESA, that includes all of our partners. And we're all collaborating around the world as to what comes next. When the space station is done, because it has spent 30 years in orbit, what comes next are these commercial space stations. And that's what I'm working on now. And with that, I think I'll just take some questions. Thank you, Tara. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, so going back to the beginning, what happens if you uh, get cut in space and your cut bleeds? Oh, uh, well, you bleed normally. It, the blood will flow. Fortunately, blood doesn't flow quickly enough to behave any differently. Um, there are some studies that show, though, uh, that, that the wound heals slower in space. So there are some immune changes. It takes a lot longer for a cut to heal. But we do have medical equipment on the space station. So you can put a Band-Aid. We even have stitches if needed. And we have medicine for pain. So we have ways to treat it. But it does take a lot longer to heal. Um, and does being in space impact upon digestion? You mentioned that, didn't you? Yeah. So when we chew and we swallow and the food goes down, one of the first things before, human, you know, before humans were sent to space, scientists were worried that what, what happens if we swallow? Can we eat? Because there's a, a component of gravity to that. 
But it turns out we know now that the component of gravity is really small. So most of when we eat and we swallow, this is all muscles that squeeze and propel our food from our mouth to our stomach and then uh, and through our intestines, right, for digestion. So that part, mechanical part, seems to work out. The absorption of the food and the vitamins turns out to be somewhat different. Uh, we only know this because of the changes in body mass. Uh, when our astronauts come back, they lose weight, they lose mass. Um, and we do blood profiles to look at the vitamins in their blood. So, so there may be a component of digestion um, that uh, absorption that is affected. The other part, but it, it doesn't seem to be a, a problem for astronauts. The other part that astronauts will say is they have a problem <laughs> um, moving food through completely. So they'll eat food and it'll just get kind of stay in their stomach. Um, and make them not feel so good sometimes for a little while until their body gets used to, oh, this is a new reflex response. You're waking up at new times, you're eating at new times, microgravity is here to stay, let's adapt. And like everything else, the body adapts and eventually food keeps moving th completely through the system. But for a while, they could be troublesome for some astronauts. They get through it with the help of some, some medicine. Okay, that's interesting. My mother always used to say you had to sit up straight after you've eaten a meal. So right. there is some truth in that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. This is a really interesting question, actually. Um, on the subject of resilience, have your academic grades been flawless the whole way through your education, or have there been times that are a little lower than you hoped for or needed for a specific opportunity? And if so, what was your response? So in high school, I was always C's in math. Like it was that was it. I would miss honor roll because I always had C's in math. And, and A's and B's and everything else. Turns out, um, of course, you need those grades to get you into a good college. That I was good enough to get into college. What I didn't mention is the first college that I went to, um, I, was the, I was the first generation student. That, I was the first in my family to ever go to college. They didn't really know what to do with me, but so I figured out I wanted to go to college. And, um, and so to be able to go to college and to be able to afford it, I had to work three jobs at the same time. Um, one was overnight as a as a night receptionist. And so in the first three semesters, my grades, I just couldn't keep up with the with all the jobs and the and the things. So my grades slipped from like pretty decent three point five the first semester all the way down to like a two point seven. And I feel I think I got like a a D in like calculus or something. like i was I was really to me, this was like the first time I'd ever failed, felt like a failure. And um, I, I had to leave, I, I left. I left after three semesters and I, and I went home and I didn't wanna be at home. I didn't wanna be one of those statistics that couldn't make it. So what I ended up doing was applying to be a counselor at space camp in Huntsville, Alabama, till I could get my head back on straight and stay in the game until I could get back and maybe pick a different school that I could afford. And so I was the counselor at space camp for nine months, found a school that I could better afford, applied, and they had pity on me and let me in. I guess I wrote a really good essay. <laughs> and when I got in, that's where I belonged. And I, it was more affordable. I found my tribe in the people who also loved space and supported my ideas for space. So um, I will tell you, my fear for, for my grades in, in college was never about a career. It was about, will it hurt me applying to the astronaut program? When the astronaut office sees those grades, and as it turns out, it didn't hurt me because I did get uh, an interview. I was accepted a few years ago to be one of the final 120 people out of thousands of applicants that NASA interviewed to be an astronaut. And the grades are not what they, well, yes, I had to submit my grades. They didn't ask me why I failed at, at, at the first university. They asked me about things that I overcame, the resilience, right? They asked me about the weird things I've done on my resume. What makes me me? Um, what do I think about things? So the grades, I think, are important to get you into things like internships. I got turned down from one internship. I worked harder, got better grades. Next year I applied, I got in. Um, so it, it, of course they're important for the small steps that get you along to the big picture. In the end, it's the small steps that, take, that you take that gets you where you really wanna be. And if grades are a part of that, you have to factor that in. Um, but in the end, <laughs> right now my grades do not matter. <laughs> but they've not always been great. They've, 
Yeah, they've well, kind of answered one of the other questions, actually, which is about do you need to get the highest marks and assessments to work in space? Because it's no. obviously a competitive career, but you've just kind of said that actually it's about who you are as an individual and, and finding your tribe, isn't it, really? Yeah, and you know, it's really hard because we get so many great resumes and everybody's got the really great grades, right? And for me, I'm like, great, you've got a 4.5 <laughs> or whatever. You've got like a really... But for me, I really like to know the rest of that person and, and whether you're a good fit for the hard work we're about to do as a team. And I will tell you, Blue Origin is that way. SpaceX, I don't know too much about SpaceX, but they're highly competitive as well. And, and the interview processes for these commercial companies are very, very long and very, very grueling because they spend the day getting to know you. Because so many people want to kind of work there, but there are, as you said, lots of other opportunities that are linked to space that, you know, um, have you been actually in space yourself? No, I haven't. So that dream has not yet been realized and I'm not going to quit. Um, you know, I'm getting older, but um, I mean, if, if they, if the application process is open, why would I not apply? Anything's possible these days. And, and it's not just NASA anymore. It's not just government agencies. These small private commercial space companies are, are sending people to space too. So, you know, while I was sad that I didn't make it to NASA, um, I'm not quitting. No, exactly. Somebody said, what do you think your next career step will be? Well, in a way, you've taken your next career step, haven't you? Um, yeah. In, in your new job. Um, there's a couple of questions about how our bodies react to being in space. So people have said, what if you're ill in space, how would it be different from being ill on Earth? Well, it depends on what the illness is. If, um, if it's a critical emergency, uh, like I mentioned, wound healing is tough. Um, we do have medical equipment to treat critical emergencies, things like a defibrillator, uh, uh, um, uh, stitches, emergency dental surgery, emergency appendicitis, anything you can think of, our, our, we've got the medical equipment and the capabilities to treat it. Um, our astronauts are trained on the ground to, uh, for, the, for basic and probably actually advanced medical procedures. Not all of them who fly, of course, are medical doctors. And then we have ways that we do telemedicine. Uh, we have ultrasound devices on orbit that we can diagnose what's going on inside the body if we need to. Uh, imaging capabilities that we can call down to the doctors at, at NASA and ESA and our partners and work to understand what the illness is. And then we have a quite a wide range of potential treatments and those medical kits to treat that. If the crew got really, really ill or injured, there's always a way to come home. Um, we have uh, vehicles always attached to the International Space Station that the crew could get in in an emergency and come right down home if they need to. Fortunately, we've never had that situation before in an emergency. We did have the first ever blood clot or deep vein thrombosis in space a few years ago. Um, that was just found during a routine medical checkup and uh, never happened before. Uh, it was a great challenge for our medical doctors to figure out how do we fix this blood clot so it's not out of control and a threat to our astronaut. And we were able to treat with the medicine that we sent up uh, temporarily, and then we were able to send up even a, a different uh, dose of medicine and a different prescription that eventually treated the clot, and the the crew member returned in in great shape. So that was an interesting test for us. That was the most that we'd ever done. Yeah, there must be nothing worse than feeling that you're stuck somewhere where you can't get back to Earth, yep. kind of thing. And, that would be awful. And, and I will tell you, for we, they don't really get cold, they don't get sick in space, they don't catch colds, you know those things, um, because they're quarantined. We know, we now know what that means after all of our past few years of experience, they're quarantined for a few weeks from anybody, uh, from a lot of people uh, before they launch so that they're, they're uh, not carrying a virus or, or sickness. Somebody has asked if there's weather in space. Weather? Um, a different kind of weather. It's, it's called space weather and it's mostly what comes from the sun or galactic rays, uh, the, the particles that are more dangerous to the, us in space and less dangerous on Earth because on Earth we have an atmosphere. So yes, there are so there is solar weather that can affect the instruments. It can affect the station. In fact, we can get these solar flares from the sun. Um, some of them are more predictable than others. Mostly not predictable, but we know when when they've happened and it's on its way to station. The station can take um, uh, procedures to move move away from it a little bit, and the crew inside can. Uh, 
do procedures to protect themselves from it. So there is space weather. It's called space weather. Um, and it's not my area of expertise, but it's darn interesting <laughs> and important. Okay, we'll just take a few more questions here that have come through uh, before we wrap up for the session, because I know some classes are having to leave now. Um, <clears throat> one question here, will the average person have to fix a problem on the space station if it's on the outside of the station? I guess, can any of the astronauts fix something if, it, if the issue is outside? Yeah, any astronaut who is going to the space station has been trained on the ground to do a spacewalk to fix any problem that might arise on the space station. They're very, we train them in a big swimming pool uh, in their white spacewalk suits. Uh, and they, uh, the swimming pool has a mock-up of the space station outside of the space station. So they get very familiar with the vehicle. They know all the ins and outs and they're trained on potentially emergency procedures. And there's been a lot of spacewalks. There have been a handful of spacewalks that have happened unpredictably, but they were able to be managed because they were trained appropriately and can communicate with the experts on the ground who have access to a ground-based replica of what they're seeing in space. Okay. Um, and yeah, there's things like, somebody's asked about, is it easy to do things in space, like draw, play ball games? Is it different in space? And I guess they, that's part of the experimentation, isn't it? That's sure it. That's the fun part of experimentation. And that's different for everybody. But yeah, if you throw a ball, you've probably seen videos, you can throw that ball and uh, it'll, what you put in motion will go into motion until you stop it, right? Newton's law. So uh, you throw that ball, it'll go forever. And it may not go where you want it to go because you think that you're throwing it in gravity. You know how gravity is gonna drive that, that trajectory of the ball. In space, you have no concept of that. <laughs> so you throw the ball, it may go way over there uh, and, and, and keep going. Uh, and so that they take some time to figure it out. Those are things that each individual can test out and have fun with. Great, thank you. Um, somebody's asked, will there ever be another manned mission to the moon, do you think? Yes, uh, uh, NASA and its partners has a program called the Artemis program. Artemis is the, is the mission that will be sending humans back to the moon. Artemis 1 is going to launch in just a few months. I just saw the big vehicle out at the Kennedy Space Center. It's on the launch pad going through some tests. It won't have humans in it. The first one won't have humans in it, but the following ones will. The second and third will, uh, the second one, I believe the second one will have humans that'll orbit the moon. And the third ones will have humans that will touch the surface of the moon and get down. I believe that's the order now. Okay, thank you. And just to finish off, because I know that anybody who's reading the chat will be dying to get an answer to this question. And you can tell um, the age group of all the students will, who've asked this question. I think I know so, what this is gonna be. Yeah, you know. So do farts work the same in space or do they just float around? Do they smell worse? Now that is an interesting question, isn't it? I have never asked. Okay, I thought you were just gonna ask me how to go to the bathroom in space. Well, somebody has never... asked that as well. I'm surprised my 15 year old daughter has never asked me that growing up either okay. about specifically about passing gas parts in space. Um, I have never asked a colleague about that. I, you know what, I have some homework to do. I'm yeah, going to go find out. A, but you've just, um, so Campbell Village College, you've just inspired some curiosity to um, find out what these astronauts are, are going to now have to answer that question because they probably- I think it'll be an interesting student, a student experiment. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely a student experiment there that's brilliant thank you so much and I guess there's so many questions you can ask once you start thinking about it can't you there's just so much to think about and it, that gives you an indication of how many roles there are so not just the people who are there doing those experiments but all the people on the ground who helped yeah. get them there and to think up you know what we really need to know that will help us you, know, you, you said it right experiments. Helen but and by the way for the six people who are on the space station at any one time, there are tens of thousands of people around the world. Thank you for bringing that up, making it happen on the ground, <laughs> supporting that effort. Yes. That's brilliant. So thank you, Tara. That was a fascinating talk. And I, I think everybody, well, you can tell from the amount of questions there that it's really kind of fired people's imaginations and their curiosity. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, please let us know um, how you found it today and we wish you all a great day and uh, National STEM Clubs Week as well. So thank you Tara so much for joining us today and um, bye everybody and um, yeah enjoy the rest of your day.